Hello everybody, my name is Kara, and today I'm here with my July wrap-up. The first book I finished was Thirst by Mary Oliver. This is a collection of poems that primarily focuses on, I would say, three different kinds of poems or three different topics. One of them is nature, one of them is the grief that Mary Oliver felt after her partner of many years passed away, and the other is on Mary Oliver's spiritual connection to the earth and to nature and growing things. And I really loved this. Um, I always loved Mary Oliver's poetry. There were a few poems at the very beginning, like I wasn't quite sure how I was going to feel about this collection compared to some of her other ones because some of her nature poems there were a couple at the beginning that felt a little bit repetitive. There were quite a few poems later on that really, really spoke to me or that really, um, I really loved and I felt like were really emotional and beautifully told and I gave this collection five stars. Next, I finished Wicked Fox by Kat Cho. This is the first book in the Gumiho series and this is an own voices Korean urban fantasy that focuses on Gumiho and those are Korean fox spirits and Mi Young is one of those fox spirits and she survives by feeding on the souls of evil men. And then one day something happens that makes Mi Young question what she knows about herself and her family. She crosses paths with a human boy named Ji Hoon and this is kind of the story from there. So I really loved the setting. Um, this is set in Seoul in South Korea and I've never read something set there before and you really got the sense of what the city was like, what the setting and the culture was like. There were a couple of side characters I really liked as well, um, and I also liked some of the aspects of the ending of this book. Even though some of it was a little bit anticlimactic, the plot overall I wasn't as much of a fan of. Um, I did like that some of the twists and turns the story took actually surprised me. But honestly, my biggest problem with this book were the cast of characters. Um, they felt kind of flat, actually. Aside from those couple of side characters that I really liked, most of whom we didn't see for most of the book, um, I just felt like they're, they didn't have a lot of personality. The insta-love in this book was also pretty strong, and this is something I never thought I would say, but I almost found myself wishing for a love triangle because there was one side character that I actually think Mi Young had better chemistry with or more interesting interactions than her actual love interest. Even though he was really sweet and I liked him, it was like seeing them together just really did nothing for me. I do know that Kat Cho has stated she took a lot of inspiration from K-dramas and that's kind of how she wanted to uh, structure her plot and kind of that kind of story she wanted to tell, and I do think this book would make a fantastic K-drama. As a novel though, it kind of left me a little disappointed, and I gave Wicked Fox three stars. Next, I finished Quintana of Karin by Melina Marchetta. This is the third and final book in the Lumetere Chronicles. This book is about um, some of the kingdoms that we have already met. Lumetere is obviously the central one that we follow, but we also see their interactions with other kingdoms and other people from other countries, and how how their opinions on them have to change. Like, this book really focuses on that a lot. We started seeing that in book two, but we really see that explored more here, and we're following a couple different storylines in this book, and kind of the ultimate ultimate goal or the overarching plot is about Lumetere and the kingdoms that are threatening it, and like whether or not they will go to war with these kingdoms, but it's really a story about individual people and individual choices, and I think that's one of the reasons I love it so much. One thing that really impresses me about this series is how you get the sense of these hundreds and hundreds of years of history, even from book one, and it makes you care a lot more, obviously, because you you believe it, you believe these characters' interactions, and you believe how much they love their homeland, and like the, the deep-seated prejudices or incorrect beliefs that they have about other countries, you actually see why those happen, and you, you really want them to fight those and to give people a chance no matter where they come from. The world building is once again fantastic. The characters are so rich and detailed and multi-layered. This was a pretty emotional series finale, which is one of the reasons I was putting it off for so long, but I'm so glad I finally read it. The only reason I gave it 4.5 stars instead of the full 5 stars is because there were a couple of points where the plot lagged a little bit, where we were sort of waiting for different plot lines to meet up with each other. I wish that would have happened a little faster, but other than that, this was fantastic and I highly recommend the series. Next, I finished The Princess and the Goblin by George MacDonald. This was a book that my friend Giselle picked for me to read as, far, as part of our 5-star TBR exchange, and I had actually read this a really, really long time ago when I was little, and I hated it. And Giselle had the exact same experience, and then she reread it recently as an adult and really enjoyed it, so that's why she thought I might enjoy it. We follow Princess Irene, and she lives on a mountain, and there are goblins under this mountain that everybody in the surrounding area is really afraid of, and they want to protect her from the goblins because the goblins kind of have a history of like stealing, I think, the royal family or just like especially antagonizing the royal family. So they're obviously very concerned with keeping Irene safe. She's a little girl in this story. One of the other characters, Curdy, um, he hears about a plot that could risk Irene's life, um, something that the goblins underground are planning, and so the rest of the book is them sort of figuring out how to stop this. I liked this so much better the second time. Um, I think when I was really little I must have just not liked like fantasy parodies or like self-aware kind of fantasy stories because I hated Princess Bride the first time I saw it too and now it's one of my favorite movies. So I'm wondering if that kind of happened with this one because the writing style is very like self-aware and humorous and like doesn't take itself too seriously as a fantasy story while still being very 
charming and very much like a classic fairy tale. But I liked how some of the plotting of this book really took me by surprise and I don't know if part of that is that we now have very different fantasy tropes and when George MacDonald was writing this the tropes would have been like a, like a completely different set of expectations you know or if he's just like a very um like keeps you on your toes kind of writer. I ended up giving this book four stars and honestly I think one of the reasons I didn't like it as a kid that I still kind of feel now is because so much of this book uh takes place underground or in caves or in mines and I really didn't enjoy that. Um, I'm really claustrophobic and to read an entire book where basically half of it takes place underground and it's very convincingly described as being like underground and, get, and afraid of getting trapped there and everything. That wasn't super fun for me but um, overall I really really enjoyed this and I'm so glad I reread it this time. Next I finished A Sprinkle of Spirits by Anna Mariano. This is the second book in the Love Sugar Magic series and this is a, I guess it's kind of technically an urban fantasy series but it's like a small town urban fantasy I think. Um, and we follow our main character Leonora and this is an own voices Mexican-American story and her and her family are all cooking witches and specifically they get their magic from baking and sort of associated talents with that and I loved this one so much. Um, I loved it even more than the first book. We really see a lot more of Leonora's family relationships and that was one of the, my favorite things from the first book and I think in this book we see them expanded even more. We see Leonora's friendships a little bit more and I really enjoyed that and how complex those ended up being. And I also really enjoyed the kind of expansion of the magic system in this world as well. I think this book had a lot of really beautiful things to say about family and about love and grief and moving on and how the people you love don't really leave us and I just thought this was really really beautiful. Some really emotional scenes that I did not necessarily expect going into this and I ended up giving it five stars. Next I finished The Prodigal Tongue, The Love-Hate Relationship Between American and British English by Lynn Murphy and this was another book that Giselle had picked out for me to read and I loved this. Um, this was this is a nonfiction book about, as it says, the relationship between American and British English and I just thought this was so brilliant and so interesting. One of the main things it does is it addresses the stereotypes of American and British English using actual facts and really exploring some of these assumptions that we have about each other's accent and whether or not those are actually backed up at all by historical fact. Lynn Murphy is definitely qualified to do this. Um, she's, she's American but she has been living in the UK I think for is that like 20 years now or something, maybe more? And she's a linguist and I think she like teaches in the language department but she definitely like knows her stuff, she has a lot of experience with it and she's also in a really interesting position of being like having kind of both sides of it, you know, American and British English. I also really enjoyed the variety of sources she uses. Um, she uses obviously a lot of like scholarly texts and articles and, th and things like that, um, but she also pulls in a couple of more like popular culture things, which apparently some people on Goodreads really hated. They thought that it like threw the rest of her research into question because she was using sources that like didn't, um, I don't know, like weren't like intelligent enough. And I, I don't know, I kind of liked the mix that she had. I think it's important to look at the kind of cultural framework for the language or the culture that you're studying. Like, if, for example, if you were writing a book about American language or culture, um, if you included something about from like BuzzFeed, let's say, like, no, it's not like a scholarly text, but seeing what popular news sites, like what kind of language they're using and like what kind of like community interactions they've had and like polls that people have answered. Like no, it's not going to be the same as like using an encyclopedia but it does give you a really interesting snapshot of how a certain group of people is feeling about language or what kind of language they're using and I think she used that really well and she didn't, she didn't try and make the data say something it didn't. And this book was just so funny and so enjoyable to read. Like this is another one where I was laughing out loud at passages and I never thought a book on linguistics could make me do that. So many interesting little tidbits, like if you're somebody who likes weird facts. I think you might really enjoy this book. Um, I think honestly if you if you have any interest or knowledge of the English language, I think especially if you're an American or a British reader you might like get a lot out of this, but I think just if you speak or are interested in or know any amount of English language or culture or history you might be interested in this because she also talks about things like imperialism and how that affects language and she just she covers so much without it feeling like too much and in a style that felt really interesting and really easy to follow. There was never any time where I was lost but she also didn't talk down to her audience. I think she balanced that really well and from reviews that I read it seems like one of the only complaints people had or one of the main complaints was that she was too positive on the side of American English compared to British English. And I mean you could argue like okay well she's an American by birth so maybe she's a little biased in favor of American English 
but I actually think it kind of makes sense because she's addressing a lot of the stereotypes that we have about each other's accents or word usage. And the fact is that a lot of the stereotypes about American English are negative and a lot of the stereotypes about British English are positive, like across the board. There's obviously exceptions, but overall that's true. So if she's saying these stereotypes are not really based in fact, of course you're going to end up with a conclusion that makes American English sound better than it was before she started talking about it. I think everything I have already said adds up to a five-star book and objectively I think this book is five stars, but even on top of that as more of a personal enjoyment kind of thing, um, reading this book made me feel less ashamed of my accent and the way that I talk and the fact that I use like and that was really nice because like when I was abroad I felt super self-conscious about my American accent um, because I kind of knew all these negative stereotypes that we had about the way that Americans speak and everything so I don't know like that was just kind of a nice plus is like it made me really appreciate the way that I talk and the fact that it's not a bad thing. And just overall, it made me really appreciate the beauty of how much variety we have in different languages and different accents and different vocabularies and things like that. Um, she uses some examples from other languages that I really, really enjoyed as well. And yeah, this book was just amazing. Next, I finished Frog Kisser by Garth Nix. And this is a uh, Princess and the Frog retelling, or the Frog Prince, I think is what it's actually called, sort of. But it's more of a like fractured fairy tale kind of thing. It's like loosely inspired by this. And we follow Princess Anya and she sort of sets off on a quest to try and turn a frog back into a person and then she kind of gets caught up in more um more political things that are happening with her country and trying to take down an evil sorcerer who has taken over her kingdom and lots of hijinks ensue i just felt pretty mediocre about this one and this is one of those books where it's hard for me to point to exactly what i didn't like or what i thought was done badly because this like on paper this looks like a book i should have loved i kind of liked anya herself overall she was enjoyable i really liked the writing style most of the time um i think sometimes the self-aware fairy tale humor could go way overboard. I really liked the characters of the royal dogs and I really liked the way this book handled the exploration of civil rights and how that worked in Anya's kingdom or democracy or constitu constitutional monarchy. Like it's not super clear but unfortunately I just didn't enjoy this book very much. Um, I mentioned the writing and how that got to be too much sometimes. I thought the plot overall was just kind of boring. Like it just dragged a little bit. Um, I didn't feel like the characters themselves were anything special outside of like the couple that I mentioned. I didn't like how much traveling there was in this book. A lot of it felt super repetitive with like just being an extended quest to find objects or people. Um, I really didn't like some things about the ending and how a somewhat important supporting character was just like completely written out in a way that we were supposed to be okay with and I was really not okay with it. And yeah, just this book was not any fun. And it sounds like it should have been a lot of fun. And that made me sad. And I ended up giving Frog Kisser three stars. Next, I finished Maurice Red Mantle by Maria Turchaninoff. This is the third and at the moment final book in the Red Abbey Chronicles, one of my favorite ongoing series. Um, and rest assured that if this does end up being the third book in the series, like the final book, um, it is a satisfying conclusion. The translation was done by A.A. Prime. And I think this book was originally written in Swedish. And we follow our main character, Maurice, who was the main character in the first book as well. And after learning all of these skills at the Red Abbey, she has decided to return to her home village and use this knowledge to bring us to build a school for girls and this is kind of um a collection of letters from her to people who are originally at the abbey and we, she's writing to several different people and so through those letters we really um we see how things go for her and i just loved this so much first off the letters like the epistolary style i think i was not sure about that choice at the very beginning but i ended up loving it it's a really amazing how clear of an idea you get about this setting and these characters. I don't feel like the letters keep you at a distance from what's happening at all, which can sometimes happen. Um, I think that was an excellent choice for this story. I loved Maurice as a character. I loved so many of the other characters we met, including one at the end that I did not expect to like at all, and they ended up being like a standout for me. There is a hint of romance in this book, and I think that was also developed really, really beautifully. Um, it's just it's just such a like healthy relationship too. It was just really lovely to see that. And I really, really loved um, getting to know Maurice's family more, specifically her older sister and her mother. I, I just loved that. I loved seeing how Maurice had this idea of like who they were or of what like kind of women they were and how that's, that wasn't true. You know, like she wasn't allowing them to be as complex and wonderful as they are because despite Maurice being a great main character, um, she does have things to learn still. She does still have to grow. I just love this series overall um, message or feeling about about feminism, uh, first of all, but also of there being so many different ways to be feminist, to be a strong woman and to be an important woman and to feel fulfilled and happy in your life. There's not one right way to do that. Things that are just so important and that I think were handled with so much compassion and depth, uh, things like religious tolerance and not judging people before you really know them and giving people the ability to be 
more complex than you thought they were. And the idea that I mentioned for um, A Sprinkle of Spirits, this idea that like about grief and how much we love people and how that matters, like our, our memories of them are important and it keeps them with us. And I just think that was so beautiful the way that was done. There were a couple of seeds in this book that just brought tears to my eyes. They were so beautiful and I really, really loved the ending as well. I wasn't sure at first how things were going to turn out, but I can't imagine a better last chapter to end this book and to end this part of the story and I gave Maurice C. Redmantle five stars. Next I finished Where the Mountain Meets the Moon by Grace Lynn and this was a buddy read with my lovely friend Kelly from Cozy Reader Kelly and I have to show off the gorgeous illustrations of this book because I always do that with Grace Lynn's books. Um, but this is an own voices Chinese folklore inspired story. We follow our main character Min Li. So she sets out to ask the old man on the mountain um, how she can help her family because they are very very poor. I did end up really enjoying this. Um, I didn't like it quite as much as Grace Lynn's other book that I've read but I did really like the folklore that is incorporated into this book and I was so impressed by the ending of this one and how Graceland wove in all of these threads from the story that I didn't expect her to. Even though the same thing happened with the other book I've read from her, I was still so astonished and impressed with how full circle everything felt at the end. I really like the themes of family and I also really liked the dragon character that she meets along the way. Um, he was one of my favorite characters, honestly. I just loved him so much. I think this book had a lot of really good messages. Um, the start of it was a little bit slow and like I said, I didn't like it quite as much as Graceland's other book, but I do think it's a really, really lovely middle grade book and I gave it four stars. Next, I finished I Believe in a Thing Called Love by Marine Gu and we follow our main character Desi and she is top of her class the best at her school at everything except for romance. Uh, she is a disaster when it comes to dating or talking to boys or anything like that. So she decides that she's going to make a plan. She decides that she's going to take all of her cues from K-dramas, uh, the Korean dramas that her father loves and always watches. So this book was a wild ride because you know going in the premise is like a little bit off the wall and I was okay with that. I was ready for that. Um, Ultimately, though, I don't think this book really worked. So I'll start out with the things that I really liked. Um, I did like the way that K-dramas were incorporated into this book. I really like K-dramas, and I just think that was a really fun element. Um, although I will say, like, Desi, even after she starts watching and liking K-dramas, she was, like, weirdly condescending about it, so that was, like, not as fun. Um, but I also really loved Desi's relationship with her dad. Her dad is just, like, the sweetest, most wonderful person, and I really loved seeing all of their scenes together were, like, a highlight of the book for me. Um, and I also liked some of the dialogue of this book, like, even with the love interest, um, who was not my favorite character, uh, there were still some really cute exchanges. Oh, I also liked that Desi was popular and, like, she wasn't, she wasn't, like, the bitchy mean girl. Okay, so now all the things that I did not like about this book, um, her love interest, Luca, I, I hated him. <laughs> like, he started out just being, like, really flat and, like, a non- character almost. Like, I, I started out just being bored by him. By the end of this book, I actively hated him. He was, like, classic broody bad boy for, like, no reason, and I just hated that. He treated his family like crap, even after, like, even after learning things that should have made him think of them in a different light, he just, like, refused to. And I get that, like, he's young, but the way, like, the selfishness that he displayed and, like, his whole, like, behavior and manner and just the way he treated other people, I'm like, this, this can't all be excused by you being a young teenager. The romance made no sense. Like, Desi literally only decides that Luca is going to be, like, her target for this weird plan she has, only decides that because he's hot and he was there. This book's approach to romance is also, like, super problematic because, like, Desi put Luca and other people in some horribly dangerous situations, all for the sake of following this like K-drama list. And like, I just didn't like that. Like there's, there's a difference between doing some kind of out there things and actively putting people's lives in danger, which is what Desi did. And also she wanted to be a doctor. So I'm like, you'd think you'd, she'd be a little more cognizant of that, but she was not. And now I'm going to get into uh, some spoilers. So if you really want to read this book, skip this part, but Desi doesn't learn anything. She is in fact rewarded for all of her horrible behavior because like she keeps doing the bad things that she was doing and she ends up with Luca in the end. So it's like, it's okay, you did it for love. And I'm like, no, not really. And another thing I hated is that Desi gives up her dream for the sake of Luca. Like she wants to go to Stanford. This has been her dream for so long and she just gives it up because of Luca. And to his somewhat credit, I mean, she didn't tell him this was happening, but she made that decision and it's portrayed as being a good thing because it's like, oh, well, she realized that she didn't actually want to go to Stanford. She loved the idea of Stanford more than she actually wanted to go there. And I'm like, that's fine. It's totally cool for you to change your mind about what you want to do. I think that's actually really important and healthy to show that in books. 
but don't do it because of a boy. Like, I just, I don't understand this book, and despite the, like, cute things that I liked about it, I could only give it a 2.5 stars. Next, I finished The Turnaway Girls by Hayley Chewins, and this is a book about our main character, Delphinia? Delphernia. Um, and she lives in a society where the girls only exist to facilitate the music of men. Um, and it's kind of complicated how that works, but that's, that's like the gist of it. And Delphernia wants to sing herself. Like, she wants more than this. She wants to actually use her voice. And that's basically the story, is her pursuing that. She is rebelling against these restrictions placed on her. And I do think the concept of this book was really good. Um, the execution, though, I really, really didn't like. So besides the concept, I like the way that queer identity is kind of incorporated into this book and how we see how that functions in this very restrictive world. Um, I think that was very thoughtful. And I kind of liked some aspects of the ending. Uh, that was actually what originally made me rate this book a little higher, but after thinking about it, I still don't think it was enough to completely redeem the rest of the book. One of the main issues I had with this book was the writing style. I hated it. I know a lot of people really enjoyed it, which I totally understand. It's very poetic and flowery, and it uses all of these metaphors and everything. I found it pretty obnoxious. Like, the book would use metaphors and descriptions that, like, didn't make sense or were, like, unpleasant, but they weren't supposed to be. Like, there's one part where Del I'm pretty sure Delphernia, like, compared her tongue to, like, a dead sea slug or something like that, and, like, we weren't supposed to be grossed out by it. This was supposed to be, like, a really beautiful, um, like, emotional and evocative kind of description of her feelings, I guess, and it was just like that kind of thing like over and over and over again. There were like one or two lines that I really liked in this book that I think were, were really lovely, but the rest of it was just overwrought and confusing, and like that's the thing is it wasn't just I didn't like the writing style, it also made it really confusing to follow what was going on. I was like 30 or 40 pages in before I realized that something I had taken to be more like fancy words was actually a literal description of something that was happening, because there was no there's no indication that it was a description of what was happening. All of this writing sounded the same. I also didn't like uh, Delphernia as a main character. Like, I didn't dislike her, but she had absolutely no personality. She just felt like a vehicle for the story to happen, and which would have maybe been okay, except that I don't think the story was strong enough to support her either. Like, there was no aspect of this I think was strong enough to carry the book. I thought the setting was pretty flat. Like, Considering how overly descriptive the writing was, I really had like very little idea of what this world looked like or functioned like outside of this very restricted um, topic or area, which in a way makes sense because Delphernia's life has been very restricted, but even when she goes to new places, I didn't feel like I really understood what they were or how they worked or what they looked like even. And the plot of this book also felt super random. Um, like, characters would just like pop up and disappear. I also didn't like how music was used in this book, which was a huge disappointment. I was really looking forward to seeing how that was um, described or incorporated into this book, and I just, I didn't like it because for a book where so much of the the emotional connection depends on music and, like, this is Delphernia's, her voice and her singing kind of represents her freedom and her personality. But then this book had, like, no feeling of the magic of music. Like, I didn't get any sense of beauty or wonder or anything from it. And, like, to have to have a book where music is so important and then for it to not feel important at all, I just thought was really disappointing. Um, I ended up giving The Turnaway Girls 2.5 stars. Next, I finished Midsummer's Mayhem by Rajani LaRocca. This is a Midsummer Night's Dream retelling. Um, our main character is Mimi and she loves to bake and she sort of gets mixed up in this baking contest and then um, magical unexplained things start happening and basically she has to face the fact that there might be a little more to her baking than initially appeared. Surprising nobody, I absolutely adored this book. Uh, Shakespeare plus baking magic, just so many things about this were like a perfect recipe for a Kara book. I loved Mimi as a character and her complicated relationships with her family and how her baking and kind of the magic of this book also sort of brought those into sharper focus, um, like her insecurities and her dreams and her feelings, how those all affected um, her relationships with her family or vice versa. I loved the baking magic itself. Um, there's a couple of recipes at the back of this book that I'm so excited to try. I don't bake much, but this book and Love Sugar Magic might convince me. I loved the Shakespeare elements of the story. I liked the friendships in this book and the the like things it says about friendships and about meeting new people. I had so much fun with this. If I wanted to be really picky, I could say that there were some elements of the writing I think could have been a little smoother or like there were there were like one or two moments where the characters maybe 
should have figured something out a little bit quicker but those are really minor complaints compared to how much I loved this book so I ended up giving it five stars anyway because this is a five star book for me I just can't say anything different next I finished Unequal Affections by Laura S. Ormiston so this is a Pride and Prejudice retelling by the way this whole like summary and review of this book will contain spoilers for Pride and Prejudice um, I will put a timestamp down below if you want to skip this but if you've managed to go through life not spoiled for Pride and Prejudice I don't want to take that away from you this is kind of a what if of Pride and Prejudice where uh, we follow the consequences if uh, instead of turning down Darcy the first time he asked Lizzie to marry him, if she said yes to him instead. Uh, so in this book, that's what happens, and they become engaged, and the rest of the book is about that and kind of other characters' reactions to that and how these two people are going to navigate this relationship when their affections are unequal. Darcy knows from the beginning that Lizzie doesn't love him. Of course, he is arrogantly assuming that she's going to fall in love with him pretty quick, um, but he knows her feelings. She's very upfront about that with him, and he is like desperately in love with her, and that's kind of one of the main sources of conflict for this book. And the reasons that Lizzie accept him are explained. Um, I think they were very convincing, actually. I think that made a lot of sense for Lizzie's character. I think writing and characterization wise, this is one of the best classic retellings or reimaginings I have ever read, like specifically for like Jane Austen or like that kind of era. I think the writing really captured that period. Um, the characterization was fantastic, apart from a couple of like nitpicky things at the very beginning of the book, like the fact that Darcy is a little more romantically demonstrative than I would maybe expect him to be, and that for some reason at the very beginning of this book, I think Lizzie blushes like every other page, and I don't remember that happening, uh, but those things are very minor and they kind of like go away as the book goes on. I love that we got to see development for characters from the novel that we didn't spend a lot of time with, um, like Lizzie's family included. And it was so interesting and fun and sometimes stressful to to see how the rest of their acquaintances reacted to this engagement. Because that's one thing is like you don't really see in the original novel exactly how everyone reacts. Like you hear about some of it, but to see to see Lizzie and Darcy like announce their engagement to people was really interesting and I loved the development of our two main characters because they still have a lot of growing to do and I like the way that even though their path to where they end up is a little different, we still are seeing them get to know each other better and to respect each other and love each other. And I think the author did a really good job of having that be a comparable sort of journey to the original novel. The main problem I had was there was this one thing about their engagement that I think one of the characters didn't really think through the implications of um, until very late on in the book. And when that did happen, it was addressed, I think, satisfactorily. So that kind of alleviated some of my worries about that. But that did make it hard to fall in love with the romance as much as I would have normally, because the whole time this is happening in the back of my head, I'm like, but what about this really big thing? Like, can we talk about it? You can't just like not acknowledge that. Um, so I, I like the way that was eventually handled. I would have wanted that to be handled a little earlier and a little more explicitly, um, but I did still give this book four stars. Next I finished The Dragonette Prophecy by Tui T. Sutherland. This is the first book in the Realms Realms of Fire? Wings of Fire series? I don't remember. This group of I think five dragonettes has been kept secret as part of a rebellion um, to overthrow a one of the dragon rulers or to like fight for a particular dragon to end up on the throne. There's a lot of like kind of confusing team-ups between all of these different dragons. Like there's like these, there's several pages of explaining to you what kind of dragon is which and who's in charge and I think it was still confusing. <laughs> I feel like the overall plot was just boring in a lot of places, uh, in addition to being unexpectedly gory in a way that like I don't think was addressed and like this is a middle grade or children's series and I'm not saying like kids books can't have violence in them because obviously they can but I, the way that it was done in this book made me uncomfortable because the way that it contrasted with the tone of the rest of the book that was like very very young feeling and then it's like oh well a dragon just got all of his limbs ripped off in excruciating detail and i'm like what <laughs> i also didn't like the fact that humans still existed in this world I thought it was gonna be like everyone's a dragon and every once in a while there would be humans involved. I just didn't like it. I didn't like the way humans were used here. Also I really hated the ending of this book, um, like the very very end. There's like an epilogue or something that has one of my least favorite tropes <laughs> uh, probably ever and I just feel like that was a cheap ploy. The only thing I did really like about this book is I was surprisingly attached to some of the characters. Um, like, I did actually care about the dragonettes. Like, I kind of went back and forth on which ones were my favorite. I basically liked all of them, actually. Uh, but I don't think I enjoyed this enough to continue to the next book. I gave the dragonette prophecy two stars. Next, I finished Vinegar Girl by Ann Tyler. This is a modern Taming of the Shrew retelling, and our main character is not Kat, Kate Batista. Um, and her father is 
like working on this disease research or something and his assistant is from Russia and he's there on like a work visa but then his work visa expires and the marriage plot of Taming of the Shrew happens because um, he decides he's gonna try and convince his daughter Kate to marry his assistant Piotr, I think is his name, so that he can get a green card and it's just gonna be like a marriage of convenience trope and blah blah blah. I did not like this book at all. Um, the one thing I can say for it is that it was quick to read and for that reason sometimes it was very engaging. Like there was a part of me that did care about seeing if Kate and Piotr would actually get together for real and like seeing if their relationship would develop. So like I was kind of invested in this book. But everything else about it I did not like. So I didn't like uh, how a lot of the sexism in this book was not challenged. Um, I didn't feel anything for the romance between Kate and Piotr. Like nothing at all. Um, to the point where like he was introduced for the first time and I'm like this can't be the guy she's gonna end up with, right? Like there was no chemistry there whatsoever, no development to their relationship. The characters themselves also I don't think were very well drawn or well developed at all. Um, they felt very flat. Um, there's a lot of stereotyping too, uh, not just of Piotr and like his culture and language and accent and everything, but even for like side characters that weren't that important, um, there were some things said that were like stereotypical borderline racist. I also really really hated uh, Kate's dad and her si she has a sister too, what's her name? I can't remember. Bunny. Uh, so yeah, Kate and Bunny's dad was a terrible human being. I hated him and like I didn't like the fact that um, the death of their mother is just like completely brushed over and excused because like we basically hear that he he like emotionally neglected her possibly even abused her like their mother was so so miserable and it's it's heartbreaking and scary to hear about how miserable she was until her premature death and it's just completely glossed over and I think it's pretty clear from the way things were written that their mother had postpartum depression and that phrase was never used and I'm like okay well he's a doctor like he should know this but even if we accept that he he works in a different area he wouldn't be expected to know that I still don't think it was handled in an in a compassionate way like her dad is selfish and awful and he takes advantage of people he he doesn't care about anyone and he's set up as being this like charmingly absent professor and I I didn't like it, did not fly with me. Finally, the nail in the coffin for this book was the ending. So the monologue that ends Taming of the Shrew has been baffling directors for many years at this point and this book just decided to play it straight and it absolutely did not work. I think I understand where the author was coming from about like men having um, like a lot of a lot of emotional restrictions that maybe women don't have typically but the way it was said was just completely misogynistic um, and the way that ended I I hated it and I didn't like like it was not challenged at all and I didn't like the epilogue I just didn't like anything about the way this book ended the plotting was also like super random and all over the place there were like a couple of scenes I think were really well done and some of the writing I think was was good or interesting like I mentioned that I was kind of engaged for some of the book in spite of myself almost but with all the things about it that I hated I still gave an eager girl two stars. Next I finished Heartless by Marissa Meyer. This is a retelling an origin story for the Queen of Hearts and we follow our main character Kath or Catherine and all she wants to do uh, to make her happy is to open a bakery um, but she's high born and her parents have all these expectations of her about how she's going to marry the king. And before long she meets Jest who's the court jester and they hit it off, they become involved, and this is a story about their relationship and about a lot of other things going wrong in Hearts at the same time and ultimately about Catherine and her decisions and if she's going to choose what makes her happy or what people expect of her and how all of those things play out. And I have heard like wildly mixed reviews of this book, uh, mostly negative, but I really really enjoyed this. I think Marissa Meyer excels at inevitability. We're reading this book and we know that Catherine becomes the Queen of Hearts. Like we know that who the Queen of Hearts is from the original Alice in Wonderland. She's like not a nice person. Um, so we know, we have some inkling of what's going to happen along the way, but you still like you still feel like you don't know what's going to happen. Um, I felt the same way with Ferris, Marissa Meyer's uh, origin story for Lavana. I was so impressed with how she can build a believable backstory for a villain and even though you know where they end up you're still hoping they don't. I really really loved the relationship between Jest and Catherine. Like Jest himself I just loved him. He was a great character um, and I really like the writing of this book and the setting. Um, Marissa Meyer's writing style just really works for me personally and in this book I really liked how it sort of mirrored the whimsy and strangeness of Wonderland or of Hearts. The way that characters would talk to each other, the way certain things were described, the way 
things weren't always explained the way you would normally expect them to be. I really liked that. I can see it not working for some people, but for me it felt very in line with the style of this book. I also really loved the ending of this book. Like that very, very last scene, it was just chef's kiss. Beautiful. I loved it. Uh, very satisfying to me. Um, and I also, I really appreciate how the King of Hearts in this book, like, he's not a bad guy. Like, you shouldn't hate him, but I hated him so much. It was great. Um, I had a great time reading this book. The only thing I will say is that in spite of the character arcs that were really, I think, well handled, um, there were a couple places where it felt a little more frustrating or less believable to me than others. But other than that, I really, really loved this book. I see why a lot of people don't, but it really worked for me, and I gave Heartless four stars. Next, I finished Trail of Lightning by Rebecca Roanhorse. This is a Navajo-inspired urban fantasy slash post-apocalyptic, uh, slash paranormal book, and we follow our main character, Maggie. Um, she's a monster hunter, and in this world, um, after this big disaster, or multiple natural disasters, maybe, um, the Navajo Nation has sealed itself off from the rest of the world, and their, their, like, gods and monsters and, like, folklore beings and everything are roaming free and sometimes causing trouble. So we follow Maggie and her companion, Kai, as they go on a journey to try and figure out like, what is happening, like, who is creating these, this certain kind of, like, really bad monster that has shown up. I really, really loved the folklore, like, the Navajo folklore and uh, myths and stories and characters from those stories and how those were worked into this book. And I also loved Kai, uh, her, the, like, male lead of this book. He was just so sweet and funny and charming, and I just, I loved him. Um, honestly, I think he could do better than Maggie, but he was a great character. Uh, there were a couple of the side characters that I also liked, I thought were really interesting and well-developed and very complex. Um, and there were a couple of things about the ending that I did really like. But overall, I kind of ended up feeling sort of middle of the road about this book. A uh, big part of that was Maggie herself. She just felt like a, such a bland character to me. Um, she felt like a very generic urban fantasy female lead who's like tough as nails and she drinks her coffee black and like she, she wears a leather jacket. And while the Navajo elements obviously make this a very uh, different kind of book from those, I think that Maggie herself didn't stand out too much. I also wasn't a huge fan of her backstory. I don't know if that is also something that's kind of stereotypical for urban fantasy heroines, because I haven't read as much urban fantasy as some other genres. Um, but it was just like tragedy after tragedy for seemingly no reason. Um, like I think there were other ways that we could have developed Maggie's character without giving her all of these terrible things in her past. Um, like some of them were like horrifying and I was like, why, like, why did it have to be this bad? I mentioned that I liked the very, very end of this book. Like there's like, there's like this one scene at the end. I liked that we ended there, but before that, like the big like reveal or where you're, where you're finally figuring everything out, I was really disappointed in it because it was one of those cases where the reveal makes the entire book actually less interesting and less complex. So overall, I gave Trail of Lightning three stars. And finally, the last book I finished in July was The Steps Up the Chimney by William Corlett. This is the first book in the Magician's House series, and this was actually a gift from my lovely friend Claudia from Spinster's Library, so thank you so much, Claudia. This is one of her favorite series, and I really, really enjoyed this. So we follow three siblings, William, Mary, and Alice, and they are sent to live with, with their uncle and his girlfriend for Christmas break, and they live in this old crumbling house that is very mysterious, and of course they start uncovering strange things about this house and about possible like magic and they meet a mysterious man who may or may not be a magician and I had a lot of fun reading this. Um, I really like the children themselves. I think they were really well developed. Um, I do think that maybe the author went a little too far in the whole like, oh, young girls get crushes on everybody, right? Like sometimes that got a little much, but overall I really liked the children and their relationship with each other felt very believable, um, very like loving, but also irritating each other. Uh, and I really like how subtle some of the characterization for them was, because it was the kind of writing where halfway through the book you'd be told a, a characteristic or a trait about one of the characters, and you would remember seeing them express that trait before you were informed of it, if that makes sense. It just made them feel like more natural characters, and I really enjoyed that. Um, I like the little bits of like feminism that we got in this book. I loved the like almost like creepy atmosphere of this book. Um, like it was actually very chilling in some places and I really enjoyed that. And there were also a few scenes having to do with animals that I thought were just so beautifully described and so atmospheric. And like those were some of my favorite scenes in the book. I just loved those. Um, the only things about this book that I didn't love, I, I'm not like wild about the 
kind of larger plot they're setting up, like this whole like saving the world thing. I'm not completely sold on that. And their like mentor type character um, is also not my favorite at this point. But overall, I really enjoyed this book and I gave it 3.75 stars. Okay, everybody, so those are all of the books I read in July. Thank you guys so much for watching. I will see you soon with another video and I hope you love the next book you read. Bye.